worship him, different ages, different backgrounds. But if we have faith in the Lord Jesus, if we've trusted him, we're united in Christ here to worship uh, the living God. Listen to these words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we take time to remember the invitation of Jesus. There is much in life that can burden us, that can wear us out and bring us down. Lord, we come to Jesus who promises us, us rest. We thank you that Jesus is the one who has satisfied all the demands of justice, who has fully paid for sin. He is the one who can make us right with you, who can bring us all the way to the new heavens and earth. We thank you for your eternal son in whom rest is found. We thank you that in learning his law and his requirements, Lord, that it is easy. There's rest for our souls. There's freedom found in Jesus. Our Father, it is our prayer today. By the Holy Spirit, you would refresh us, awaken us, you would rebuke us, correct us, you would encourage us and remind us that we are beloved children in the Son. Father, please would you be glorified. Would we bring you our praises full of thankful hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our first hymn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Please stand when you hear the music. Well, warm welcome to everybody here. Um, it's lovely to be together. Thank you for battling through the rain to, to come here. Um, tea and coffee at the back served after. Crash is laid out Sunday school as well uh, this morning. Um, some notices uh, for the week to come. We're meeting this evening at five o'clock this morning. Uh, we are considering Exodus and the commands about the Sabbaths and the festivals that the Lord gave his people. We're considering that this morning and this evening. We're going to do something slightly different. We're going to be thinking about goodness, how God works goodness in the life of his people. So that's this evening at five o'clock. And then um, a little bit of a different week. Um, I'm away for three days at a conference, a leaders conference in Blackpool. Uh, that's something to do with the FIEC, the Fellowship of Evangelical Churches. It's possible that you might come along to our church and, and think, well, what are you guys? What are you? And the answer is we're an independent evangelical church. So we believe in the centrality of the gospel the authority of scripture. And we believe that the local church should be self-governing. There's no bishops or anything uh, out there in some room in charge of us. We have two elders. We're a self-governing uh, congregational church. But that doesn't mean we're isolated. When the church was started, um, it became part of the FIC, which is a, a, a national uh, organization of independent churches, about 600 of them across uh, the UK. We also have fellowship with like-minded Welsh churches as well through the evangelical movement of Wales. Well, why is that important to you? Because what we're doing here on Sunday morning may f seem quite small, but we're part of a movement of gospel churches in Wales and England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. There are churches we're in fellowship with that are as big as 800, 900 churches in London. There are churches who are working with heroin addicts and council estates in, in, council estates in Scotland. Um, there are all kinds of different churches. They have all kinds of different styles, all kinds of different leadership. But what unites us is the gospel. And it's good to be part of something big. We're trying to reach the UK for Christ with the gospel. And actually, we're a small church, but our reach with the FIC is quite big. They've supported us for a number of years. A lot of the people who come on holiday uh, come from FIC churches, uh, which is good. And also for this three years, 
part of the way our church supports the work of the FIC, uh, as well as giving in our mission fund towards the work. Um, I'm serving on the trust board uh, of the FIC for, for a three-year term. So it means that we're able to contribute some of our experience of our context and, and being a, a small church to that wider work. So please do pray for these next days as leaders from all over the uh, UK, not just pastors, but their wives, um, women's workers, children's workers, youth workers. There's about a thousand people gathering in Blackpool. Just pray that there would be an encouragement uh, by the spirits uh, for God's people that way. Um, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, there will be a prayer meeting uh, led by Phil in the afternoon here. No, um, no Bible study prayer meeting in the evening. Thursday morning, toddlers uh, at nine uh, o'clock and 11 o'clock, it's the ladies group uh, meeting together. Please do see Rachel about that. And then services morning and evening on the Lord's Day next Sunday. You need to know two things about next Sunday. Uh, first thing you need to know is that we collect, uh, well, we do this special thing. Robin runs this wonderful project with Blythe's Woods, and it's the Christmas shoeboxes. Pardon? Robin and Rian. Okay. Uh, and uh, um, what we've got a list here. Basically, it's gathering a shoebox. I'm sure you've seen that before with items in it that would be helpful for a, a, a child or an adult. Uh, an encouragement in a, in a needy and impoverished part of Europe or Asia. And uh, these shoeboxes are sent out. There is scripture and a gospel tract put inside them. So it's evangelistic as well. The school collects for it and we collect for it. The last uh, collection for that, the last Sunday, is uh, next Sunday. So I have some sheets here. If you want guidelines about it, please do see Robin and Rianne. After, But if you want to get involved in that, we do it in our house, don't we, through the school. It's a really good thing to do, an encouragement before Christmas. So that's the last Sunday for Blyswood next Sunday. Next Sunday as, as well is Remembrance Sunday. As we're meeting in the Naeth Guffa, the Memorial Hall, where there's um, remembrance plaques, um, it does mean that next Sunday at half past 11, people from... Uh, the Holy Trinity Church will be coming in to lay wreaths uh, in the foyer. So next Sunday, we're going to be finishing our worship. It's going to be a shorter service uh, than normal. Don't cheer. Um, uh, and uh, it means that um, at about 25 past 11, we'll, we'll finish our time. And if you want to, you can go into the, 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 the foyer and just witness the wreaths being laid. I think that's quite uh, respectful to the community because those are names of people from the village. Uh, some people's parents gave their lives fighting uh, and, it, it, um, and grandparents. So I think that's a good thing to do. But we'll be having our own act of remembrance in our service next week as well. Okay, I think that is everything. But just please do keep praying for uh, Marion's uh, great-grandson, Torben. It's such a huge thing. This little boy's had this uh, brain tumor, tumor um, and they're looking at moving him for um, proton beam therapy. So it's, 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 it's a huge thing for Torben and his mother and family. But they do know, at the very least, that we're praying for them. So continue to pray uh, for Torben. Um, okay. Yes. Boys and girls. We've got boys and girls here. Now, what's this? A cabbage. It's not a cabbage. It is an iceberg lettuce. Okay, and it's got the best big fall dates, 4th of November. <laughs> so, would you want to eat this today? No, you never want to eat it. Would you want to eat this? Who likes lettuce? Would you want to eat this tomorrow? Would you want to eat it in a week's time? Two weeks' time? Three weeks' time? No, 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 it would have run out. It's got the best of the dates. Now, things at the moment, this if you listen to the news, are changing all the time. There was a joke that a newspaper did about a prime minister that we had. Would she last as long as a lettuce? <laughs> uh, and she didn't. And there's so much change. Things are changing all the time. Then I noticed. Uh, uh, when I went to spy yesterday in the newspapers, now they're asking, there's this big rich man who's bought 
Twitter, Elon Musk, will he last as long as Alexa is? Everything's changing. Everything, no, there's so much turbulence. And you think, well, things change in my school, things change with my teachers, things change in my family, everything changes. Is God's word like a lettuce that goes off after this? Do his promises last? It's a verse in the Bible, Hebrews 13, let me check, I think it's Hebrews 13, verse 8. Yes, Hebrews 13, verse 8, that says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is a leader who will last, and we can trust him every day. He never changes. Promises are always the same. His love is always the same. His person, who he is as God and man, is always the same. When you think of the lettuce, and the, the next time somebody says, oh, they're not going to last as long as the lettuce, which has become a thing now, well, we remember that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's a song. Well, I know this one. Ila, you like this one. It's to a familiar tune. Okay. So, I'll sing it to you. See if you join God knows all about me. Yes, it's true. He knows about me and he knows about me. From the beginning to the end, God will always be my friend. Famous tune. Okay, do you think you can sing that? Do you think? Let's try it. I was looking, so you can sing. Do you think you can do it? God knows all about me, yes, it's true. He knows about me and he knows about you. From the beginning to the end, God will always be my friend. Excellent. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that all men change, but Jesus never. And Lord, as so much changes in both the boys and girls and sons, that we would know that our own will always be my friend. What a wonderful Amen. We're going to sing together as we take up our offering uh, to the Lord's work. Um, this is some words that we sang in, in conjunction with it, in with the Ten Commandments, and it's to a familiar tune, crown him with many crowns. That in Christ we are free, freedom and life are ours, for Christ has set us free. Never again submit to powers that lead to slavery. Christ is the one who breaks our chains, our bondage ends. Christ is the rescuer who makes the helpless slaves his friends. So please stand when you hear the music and we'll sing together. Well, let's, let's come, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus. We are free. In Christ, we are free from the harsh demands of the law, free from trying to earn our way to heaven, free from pleasing other people just for that sake. We are free. We are beloved children. Our sin has been paid for. We have been given the Spirit. We are free indeed. So, Father, we thank you for the freedoms that we have in Christ. We thank you for the freedoms that we have in this country to assemble for worship. We thank you for the freedom of conscience that we have, that we might see differently on, on many different minor issues, but we're not to bind each other's consciences necessarily on, on minor things. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we, we do have. And yet we recognize as your free people, we are slaves of Christ. We belong wholeheartedly to him. And we pray that that would be a reality in our lives and that Christ, his law of love and liberty, we would be bound by it. And we would live as people who are, 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 are totally under the rule of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that when we look to Jesus and his teaching and his commands and his law, we find that it is a yoke, but it is a yoke by his spirit and by his goodness that is easy and light. We pray that we will know 
uh, the, the goodness and grace of Jesus Christ in our lives. And Father, we pray for ourselves uh, as a church that we would proclaim freedom. Uh, we pray, Lord, for the gospel as it's preached Sunday by Sunday. We pray, Lord, for um, the, the gospel as it's preached in, in the open air uh, on Wednesdays and Fridays in Pacheli and Porthmadoc uh, and the work of, of proclamation that goes on. We uh, pray for the gospel as, as we share it in our lives. We pray that we would uh, proclaim freedom to those who are bound in sin and that you would open eyes and that there would be men and women, boys and girls, brought to see that true freedom is found in Jesus. Please would you be at work amongst us, Lord. We want to pray for each other uh, in work, those of us who work, those of us who are tired, those of us who are at school, uh, those of us who have different responsibilities with families. Lord, we pray that we would be able to work well and rest well in a way that honours you. Lord, we pray for those who are burdened by us, by uh, 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 burdened amongst us by uh, illness or care or worry. Um, Lord, we pray that you would help each one of us to rest in your promises and in your grace. Um, we do pray as a church you would provide for us as we are still looking at this building project in Tabernacle, as a local community are, 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 are starting to know and hear about it, Lord. We pray that we would be clear that we stand on the gospel. We pray that you would provide a, a base for us so that we could serve Jesus in this area. We pray, Lord, for the sale of Ron to go through. We pray that we would get uh, be able to get specifics about what the building, a tabernacle, what we can do and, and what the costs will be, Lord. We thank you for your provision so far and ask that you would provide. But we want to pray for more than buildings. We want to pray for people. We pray that we would be sustained and in our families and in our individual lives, we would know you working. We pray particularly for Torben, um, Marion's uh, great-grandson. What a huge thing this, this boy has been through. Lord, please would you sustain his family Please, would you give him a sense of peace? Uh, Lord, we pray um, that uh, Marion's granddaughter would know that Christians are praying and that she would want to reach out to you and she would find peace in Jesus. We want to pray for Kate's sister, Fiona, after her heart attack. Lord, um, we pray, Lord, that she is able to rest in you and she's able to recover in hospital, that you would be with her husband and Phil and Kate as they're concerned for her at this time. And Lord, we do pray um, everywhere where gospel-centered, Bible-centered people, uh, particularly church leaders, are being um, taught and helped at this time. We pray for the FIC conference. We thank you for a hundred years of the FIC, of gospel witness in the UK. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, it's a time of refreshment, a time of help, where you are glorified. Thank you for all the different gospel churches that there are in Britain. Uh, we pray small and large in different areas that um, there would be a reviving of gospel work. We, we long for in hard days for the gospel, Lord. We pray that there would be days of growth where conversions uh, are greater than 0% conversion rates, where there's a steady stream of conversions. There's a growth in maturity. The Christian character is, is shining, where there is a, a more attention in public life to the things of the Bible and the things of the Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, for a reviving of the work in the UK and in Europe. And we look to you and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Amen. Amen. Well, turn your eyes upon Jesus. We're going to worship together. We're going to be led in this uh, new version of a, of a favorite chorus. And we'll stand to sing when we hear. Book of Exodus, the words will green. Just to bring you to where we are, it's been four or five weeks where we've been going through the covenant law after the Ten Commandments the application of those commandments to life in the lands. And as Christians, we're not under the Sinai law. And yet as it's fulfilled in Christ, there is so much wisdom here. And so we've got to listen uh, to these words so carefully. 
And I want to read you this section that we're on now about the festivals and about the Sabbath. So, Exodus 23, verse 10 to verse 19. For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what they leave. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the slave born in your household and the alien as well may be refreshed. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. Three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Celebrate the Feast of Harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the Feast of Ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. The fat of my festival offerings must be not kept until morning. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Well, I want to speak to you about rest and about worship. First of all, let me tell you a story. There once was an ugly duckling and it didn't get on with the other ducklings because it didn't really walk like a duckling, it didn't talk like a duckling, it didn't fit with any of the ducklings and life was burdensome and sad for this duckling until one day as it was weeping it looked in uh, I think a frozen pond and uh, realized Looking in, it wasn't actually a duck at all. It was a swan. And it was made to soar with the swans. That's where its identity was. That's what it was for. That's where its freedom was. I'm going to talk about Sabbath and festival. And I'm talking about who you really are as a Christian. What you were made for. Where your freedom is found. You see, life is so complex. There's so many competing voices. There's so many rival ideas. There's so much in our world that needs doing, that needs to be attended to. Life can feel like, even if you're retired or if you're working, it can feel like you are spinning plates or that you're on a treadmill. There are voices and anxieties all around us. It's so easy as a Christian. For the voice of God, your heavenly father, to get drowned out. It's so easy to slip into thinking like the world around you. How can we make sure that the Lord is the one that we listen to? The Lord is the one that we are devoted to. How can we catch a sight of who we really are? Now, here's Israel. And they are the saved people of God. They're in a special relationship with him. He's made a covenant with them at Sinai. He's rescued them to be his special people. He's given them 10 commandments to show them what redeemed people are like, how they live. And he applies them to life in the land. They'll be going into the land of Canaan. But in the land of Canaan, they'll meet the dwellers of the lands pagan worship. There'll be so many conflicting ideas. There'll be a host of deities, of voices, 
God's redemption in Egypt will seem so distant, easy to forget his law. And Canaanite religion, it is fast track stuff. It's all about fertility and getting the highest yields and the highest harvest. It's a, a kind of wedding of, of sex and agriculture. If you want this kind of God to bless you, you need to do this, you need to do this. So those kind of uh, laws in verse 18 and 19, you may think cooking a young goat in its mother's milk, that's barbaric. And it is barbaric. It's a pagan practice. It's very likely that that is to do with if you sacrifice this goat, whether the the, um, the kind of fertile milk it's been cooked in it, that kind of that bumps up your harvest. That kind of is a, a pagan fertility thing. And it's all about doing the best, having the best, biggest yields, biggest harvests, this God, that God. How? Are Israel going to avoid getting sucked in on that to that? Do you like sandwiches, by the way? I love sandwiches. Favorite sandwich, just so you know, is a cheese and brown sauce sandwich. This section, actually, the laws aren't just random lists of laws. There's a sandwich here. There's verse 10 to verse 12, Sabbath laws. Verse 14 to verse 19, laws on festivals and worship. In the middle, the filling of the sandwich is verse 13. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. So how is Israel not going to forget the Lord's? How are Israel not going to uh, get sucked into other gods? and other ways of, of living. Do you see the basic point of the passage? What is God's answer to that? Sabbath and festival. Reminding who they are. Sabbath and festival. Rest and worship. So God's gracious provision of one day in seven, that will be a Sabbath, a day of solemn rest, uh, as God rested in creation, God's commandment for them to rest as a nation and the, the, the cycle of festivals through their year was a chance to seize from worship, to realize that the routine of paganite uh, kind of uh, religion was wrong, that they weren't gods and product, productivity and blessing wasn't the king, but God is, to remind themselves of who they are to remind themselves of their identity. Sabbath wasn't about imprisoning them. Sabbath is all about setting them free. So what Jesus said about the Sabbath is so important. The Sabbath, man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. It is about the gift of rest and worship. So the same is true for us. If we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, God who created everything gives us rest. He commands us to rest. It's a command for us to Sabbath, and it's a command for us to celebrate and worship. It's a command because God knows what is best for us. We're like ugly ducklings who forget who we are. We need to see the freedom that we have in Christ. Imagine now there's a group from the local village on an exchange trip, and they've been over to France for three months, and they're living in French houses with different families. So for the, all of the week, they're on their own speaking French or what little French they have. And it's good, but it's bewildering. But once a week... All the boys and girls get together and uh, from the little village and they're able to speak Welsh for an hour. Maybe they sing some Welsh songs. Maybe somebody smuggled some Welsh cakes in there. In their, and they remind themselves of where they come from and who they are and the language they have and where they're going. That's what Sabbath is about. A reminder of who we are in Christ and where we are going. 
Let me just take you through the passage, and I'm going to give you three ways that Sabbath and festival, rest and worship, apply to us. So look at verse 10. There was to be a Sabbath year, one year in seven. So they weren't to go for, the, and it was an agricultural society, they weren't going to, for untrammeled kind of productivity. One Sabbath, uh, one year was a year off. Now, it probably doesn't mean necessarily that the whole of the land rested uh, for one year. It might have been a staggered Sabbath throughout the lands. But the idea was there was to be a succession of activity where the land lied plowed and unused. And so those Sabbath fields were available for the poor of the land to go and eat. At any time in a year, there would be fallow ground where poor people could go and get free foods. Wild animals were cared for. And it was the same with the vineyard and the olive grove. Now, there's a lot of wisdom in that. People look at these farming principles and say there's a lot of uh, wisdom in that. It's possible there's some nitrogen fixing going on here. There's some wisdom here, but a place for the poor to eat. But it's a recognition that humans are more important. Work is a good gift, but humans are more important than plants. Animals are important, and human rest is good. God is not a taskmaster like Pharaoh, who demands bricks without straw. Work, 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 work. He gives rest. And there was also a Sabbath day. That goes back to creation where the Lord rested uh, at the end of the week uh, on the Sabbath. It was a sign also of their redemption from Egypt, and it was a solemn ceremonial day, a strict day of cessation from work for all of them. Verse 12, so that your, your ox and your donkey may rest, the slave born in your household, the alien may be refreshed. So it was a day for refreshment of help. And it was God's sign. As you go for Exodus and Leviticus, the Sabbath is, is so important. It's a sign of who they are as God's people. So that's one half of the sandwich. The other part is there were at least three annual festivals. There's more added in the book of Leviticus. These were days where they would all gather the nation and, and the men particular, but the whole nation and their families would gather at the tabernacle. They would present offerings uh, and sacrifices. They would come to the Lord and remember who they are as God's people. They would rejoice. So there's the Passover festival that they would uh, celebrate, the Passover lamb being sacrificed and the redemption from Egypt. There was the feast of harvest at the start of the harvest the, the ingathering, Pentecost, and there was also the Feast of Ingathering, so the Feast of Booths, which must have been, I would have loved to have gone to that festival because that was just basically a massive camp out where people made shelters and bivouacs and, and rejoiced together and remembered how God kept them. These were reminders of who God is. So God gave his people, out of his grace, Sabbath and festival, rest and worship. The question is, as God's free people through Jesus, under the new covenants, how does the Lord give us rest and worship now? How do these things apply to you and me now and I know I know you're on the edge of your seat going he's going to tell me what to do and what not to do on Sunday I know he is actually if you're thinking like that you're thinking wrong because as I reflected on this week I think the principle and the practice of Sabbath is so deep it is about who we are and what we are made for so if you just go away, uh, maybe you'll go away with some principles about the Lord's Day and how to keep it. But I want you to go away thinking like the ugly duckling, this is who I am. I have a father who loves me. I can rest in his love. Because the Sabbath is about freedom. 
So Jesus, our Lord, interestingly, although he was so severe with the Pharisees about their abuse of the Sabbath, he didn't set aside the Sabbath, but kept it. He said he came to fulfill the law. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. It was to be a day of freedom. The principle of Sabbath, the practice of Sabbath continues, but it doesn't continue the same as it was in the Old Testament. And here's where the action is. We've got to see that something's been fulfilled. Something will be fulfilled when Jesus returns, but there's a principle here that continues. So how do rest and worship, Sabbath and festival apply to me? First thing, Christians, to obey God, we need to embrace rest and worship as a pattern and a principle for all our lives. So my activity as a Christian is not to be untrammeled, uh, kind of uh, uh, not stopping work all the time. I am to work well and I am to rest well. And I am to do things that refresh me and refresh those in my family and refresh those around me. When I rest, what I am doing is I am acknowledging that I am not God and it all doesn't depend on me. I am acknowledging that I am not a hamster on a wheel, that I am made in the image of God and he delights. God is uh, kind and gracious. Have you ever noticed that if you try and do everything that needs doing, it, it never gets done? Because there's always something else to do. So when I rest, where, whenever that is in the week, when I purposefully t spend time to stop and do things that, that rejuvenate me and refresh me, whether that is getting out your old Sabutio sets, watching Doctor Who, going for a walk, doing some rock climbing, things like that. When I rest or whatever it is, I am actually trusting God and enjoying his goodness. But rest here isn't just spending ages in front of the telly doing nothing. Rest and worship go together. So as a Christian, worship should refresh me. Worship, remembering the Lord's. So I'm trying to think, how does this put in practice in our lives? So time for rest, time off, but in that rest, I also think about the Lord's. So I can go for a walk and enjoy his creation. I can spend time with Christian friends, can make sure maybe there's a Christian book I'm reading. Or I spend a bit of time to listen to a Christian CD or something, and I, and I, and I remember the Lord's. And I rest and worship go together. I once heard uh, a theologian called Don Carson, and uh, somebody asked him, what do, you do to ref what do you do to rest? He says, sometimes I meditate on the book of Psalms. Like, how is that a rest? <laughs> I want to I watch Star Wars. Why, 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 why? And actually, when you think about it, actually, it is restful to worship God, to, to remember who he is. So I think in our rest, we can be too secular. We live in a world that idolizes rest and that people live for the weekend and live for their second homes and live to get away. And actually, a Christian's rest, we can enjoy those things, but they're not our idols. Rest is not just about me time. It is about, it is about the Lord's and enjoying him. So rest is a principle. I read something from a big, thick book that absolutely challenged me. Let me read it to you. This is what this guy, Douglas Stewart, says. He says this. The family that expects a wife mother to prepare 21 meals per week without respite and serve the needs of the family equally on all days violates the command, as would the dairy farmer who never takes a break from the twice daily milking or the policeman who does special duty shifts on days off from their regular shifts or the pastor who never sets for himself or herself a day off or its equivalent. People who do not observe a Sabbath, either in one day or its distributed equivalent, deny themselves and others the sort of life 
God intended. That's extremely challenging because in a family, what I find is if I don't rest, my family don't rest. That here, it's not just about you, it's about your household and those around you. Your rest has an impact on others. We rest together. So as a principle in your life, not just Sunday, but have time to rest daily, weekly. Do things that refresh you. Do not feel guilty about that. Do not try and keep up with the Joneses. Keep spinning plates. Rest now. Rest now. Work hard, but rest. And I know that applies differently. Some of you are in very demanding jobs. Others of you are in very demanding retirements. And retirement is even more difficult because there's always something to do. And yet, rest. Embrace the principle of rest. We need to remember who we are. And maybe we need to ask ourselves, how can we put more Jesus in our rest? How can there be more God in my rest? That it's not just an escape, but a, a godly rest. And also this idea of festival. It's interesting in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, how do we keep the Passover? We get rid of the leaven of malice and we celebrate the festival of uh, sincerity and truth in trust in Christ. He sees the whole of the Christian life as a festival. The whole of the Christian life is to be one of rejoicing, of meeting with God's people, of turning from sin, of trusting Christ. I am to rejoice. Um, there's two types of Christians. Uh, there's Brussels sprouts Christians and there's strawberry cheesecake Christians. Brussels sprouts Christians. When I was little, this is how I ate Brussels sprouts. My mum would say, go and eat it. It will do you good. <clears throat> oh. And then I felt proud because I'd done myself good. And Christians who say, oh, oh, I should go to church. Yes, I really should. Oh, yeah, I should read the Bible. Oh, yeah, yeah, I probably should do that. Yeah, yeah, I should rejoice. I should get more of, oh, oh yeah, do me some good. And you turn up and like, mm, yes, I've done well. Brussels sprouts Christianity is wrong. Strawberry cheesecake Christianity is different. Because when I had lemon meringue pie or strawberry cheesecake, uh, my mum said, would you like? Yes, yes, I would. I wolfed it down. And then at the end, I said to my mum, thank you. She got the praise because I had a taste for it. It was a delight. God's commands are not burdensome. Gathering with God's people, worshipping him, rejoicing in him, delighting him. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your hearts. So how can you build in rest and worship as a principle and pattern of life? Even if we don't see eye to eye on how the Sabbath applies to the Lord's day, even then, it's still a command. We've still got to build it into our lives. None of us are bigger than Sabbath. All of us need to rest. That doesn't mean laziness. It doesn't mean uh, neglecting our responsibilities. But it does mean remembering that I am not God. And he is. So embrace rest and worship as a principle of life. Second thing I want to say is this. Embrace rest and worship on a particular day. On a particular day. The Lord's Day. Sunday the first day of the week. Now, the Sabbath command is fulfilled in Jesus. He is the, Lord's, uh, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, he has done all that we could not do. He has completed, fulfilled the law. He has saved us. If we trust in Christ, we are totally right with God. And so the ceremonial aspects of the Sabbath, on the particular day it was, do not continue. The Lord's Day, I'm going to stick my neck out here, is not a Sabbath in the way the Old Testament Sabbath was. I think that from two passages in the New Testament. Romans 14, Romans 14 and Colossians 3. Romans 14, 
Paul says this, he's writing to a church of Jew and Gentiles. He says this, verse 5, one man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So he's talking about the Sabbath. There are Jewish Christians who want to keep the Sabbath. There are Gentile Christians who see all days alike. Paul allows for a variety of views. He says we do it by faith. We honor the Lord. So it seems to me from that we've got to conclude that Sunday, the Lord's Day, is not a Sabbath in the same way of the Old Testament. It doesn't come with the same ceremonial strictness. Colossians 3 is also important. Let me find Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Colossians 2. Here we go. Colossians 2 verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. He is talking about the Sabbath there. So these festivals and Sabbaths in their ceremonial Old Testament way under the new covenants don't apply in the same way. So we have freedom of conscience and liberty about what we do and don't do on Sundays. I'm not to bind your conscience. You're not to bind mine. Um, it's not an Old Testament Sabbath. But what is it? Well, it is the Lord's Day. In the Acts and in um, the New Testament, we see that the, the uh the early church meeting on the first day of the week for worship and teaching and fellowship and self-consciously celebrating the day that Jesus rose from the dead as uh, their special day of worship. It's not a Sabbath. It's the Lord's day. And it's a day for the Lord's people to meet together, to rest and to remember Jesus. That's how we fulfill the, the Sabbath command by keeping the Lord's day. Under the old covenant, if you like, you got your uh, rest at the end of the week uh, on the Sabbath. Under the new covenant, you get your rest at the start. You get it on the first day of the week. And so wherever we are on how the Lord's day should be, and I'm someone with a high day of the Lord's, uh, Lord's day, that it is a day given for rest and worship for the church, there is a freedom that we have, the practice of Sundays and, and keeping Sunday as a day for meeting with the Lord's people, for refreshment, for rest, and for worship is so important of remembering the risen Christ. The Puritans used to talk about Sundays as the market day for the soul. Uh, so when you go to market, you'd, uh, there'd be all kinds of things to gather. You'd see your friends. You'd be refreshed. You'd have a meal. Wouldn't it be amazing if Sundays was a market day where it wasn't just, oh, maybe once in the morning that I saw Christians, but I, I, I had time to have a meal with Christian friends or people from church. I had time for a rest or a walk, maybe a nap if you wanted to. I could read a Christian book. Uh, it's a time maybe to turn off Netflix but I'm not going to bind your conscience if that uh, refreshes you. There's a freedom, but it's a time to switch off from normal things and remember the Lord. As a church, it's our conviction and will be our conviction for a long time while I'm pastor, that morning and evening is good. Morning and evening services are good, that it's a good thing. I know it's not possible for everybody who lives a long way away in different circumstances, but it's not just a repeat of the morning. It's about drawing near together to worship the Lord, filling our time with the Lord. There's got time on a Sunday to do good things, to plan, care for poor, to help uh, other believers in different ways. We can embrace rest and worship as a principle of life. I think the New Testament and Old Testament together, embracing rest and worship on a particular day. I know there's a freedom on these things. 
And I know that modern life is complex. I know that days away, weekends away are lovely. But I can't help thinking that you're more prepared for life and you're more prepared to stick it out in the Christian life if you remember with your local church the Lord's Day, if that's the principle of your life. It's a good thing, remembering who you are. So embrace Sabbath and worship, rest and worship as a principle on a particular day. You can come back to me and we can talk about this, but I'm saying, yes, Lord's Day. Keep Sunday as a place where you worship with a local church. Make that a priority. Honor the Lord in that. Third thing I want to say is rest in Jesus every day of your life. Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What it means to be a Christian is that Jesus is our Sabbath. He's our rest. We turn from our own selfish works. We turn from the voices, prove yourself, do this, do that, try and be different. And we rest in Jesus. Come and look at a baby, a baby just lying in her mother's arms. She's just been fed and she is having a Sabbath. She's absolutely content. She doesn't have to work to prove her mother's love. She knows her mother loves her. She is absolutely content and at rest. The Sabbath means if we're in Christ, our Father loves us. He is pleased with us in Christ. We don't have to prove ourselves to him. We are, are given rest. We are safe in his love. Will you trust Jesus as your Sabbath, as your creator, as your Lord, as the one who gives you rest every day of your life? Because Sabbath is all about who you really are. How are you going to silence the voices of the world around you? Say, prove yourself, do this, do that. You've got to remember the Lord's. So little ugly duckling, remember who you are in Jesus. You were made to soar. Practice rest throughout the week. Make time to seek the Lord. Make time to refresh yourself. Every Sunday, make it a market day for the soul. But remember the Lord, who is good and faithful. Shall we sing? I heard the voice of Jesus say, come on to me and rest. So we close our time together. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests for his own work, just as God did from his. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.